So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's joint event of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, Republic of Ireland region, and Engineers Ireland Mechanical and Manufacturing Division, annual address of the IMECI rail chair. This year's railway division chair is Professor Felix Schmidt. Uh, and I'd like to welcome back Professor Schmidt. You may remember he gave a talk last October on comparing high-speed railway in Europe with high-speed railway in Japan. This evening's talk from Professor Schmidt will introduce the concept of systems engineering in the railway, focusing on the need to manage complicated and complex nature of the railway. Professor Schmidt's presentation will be approximately 55 minutes long, and that will be followed by approximately a 30 minute Q&A session. I just ask that if you have questions, make sure to put the questions in the Q&A field and not the chat field. Before I hand over to Professor Schmidt, I'll just take a moment to briefly tell you about our next event and our next meeting. Our next event is next Tuesday, May 11th. And the topic is the future of hydrogen and electrical transport. And this is being presented by Dr. James Carton of Dublin City University. Our next meeting will be our AGM on May 18th. Members are welcome to attend and share their views on the committee's work during the 2020 and 2021 seasons. And you are welcome to contact our chairman, Dermot Brabazon, if you would like to join the committee. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Professor Schmidt. Professor Schmidt. Thank you very much. Welcome to my IMECI Railway Division Chair's Address for Engineers Ireland. My name is Felix Schmid and I'm in my last months as Chair of the Division. Uh, I'm really enjoying being here in Dublin and of course in Ireland as a whole because it's one of my favourite countries. I'm going to talk about railway systems engineering and a bit about myself, uh, about my history uh, at work, both in railways and in other disciplines. So uh, I'm Professor Emeritus of Railway Systems Engineering at the University of Birmingham. <laughs> I also do some consultancy uh, and I still teach at the university. My interests are in systems thinking. I have just completed a module of railway traction systems with the university and uh, one on railway control systems. So I'm still doing quite a lot in that area. And I'm particularly interested in ergonomics and the involvement of people in systems. Uh, I'm going to cover quite a lot on the complicated and complex nature of railways. And by the end of this talk, you know why they are two different things. And I'm going to talk about the system of systems approach to railways. <clears throat> and what you really want to make you think about is that we always need to change. And change is not a, a bad thing, it's a good thing. We need to think about the value of people. And I, of course, I've also got some very strong views on the value of education. Uh, yes, it's going to be educational. Um, I'm going to talk about what is a system, how does the railway fit in, and I'm going to give you a bit of a history of the railway as a system combining rail and train, wheel and rail. Uh, I'm going to talk about what is a system of systems, then what determines the complicated and complex nature of railways, and particularly what aspects of railways are particularly complicated and what makes them complex and difficult to manage. I'm just going to say a few words about Perot's normal accident theory, um, because, well, trying to prevent failure is not necessarily a sound strategy, because eventually uh, you will find an error, a mistake, which gets through all the barricades which you have set up against it. I'm going to talk about the V system life cycle and the complex system adaptive cycle, which uh, was developed by a friend of mine. And then I'm going to talk about myself because hopefully that's also of a little bit of interest. And it's traditional for the uh, railway division chair to talk about their own life. 
Um, so what is a system? It's an entity which exists in an environment. It is influenced by the environment, it influences the environment, and in general, it must have a purpose, otherwise it's not of any use. And in many cases, it's got multiple purposes. So the railway takes people and goods from A to B, uh, and that's probably quite enough as a purpose. Uh, and you could also look at it as a group of interacting or interrelated entities which form a unified whole. It's got temporal and sp spatial boundaries. It is surrounded, as I said, and influenced by the environment. Uh, we can describe its structure, its purpose, and express how it works. It could also be just a set of principles or procedures. You don't have to have anything physical to have a system with which you deal. It can be about something, how something is done. It's a structure or a method. And of course, as I said, the railway system transports people and goods. Uh, and this is a definition of the Jamshidi, which I find quite useful uh, uh, because he's talking about systems of systems. Uh, it's basically defined as a set of large scale integrated entities. And the word integrated is very important that are heterogeneous. So each part is different. Each part could work on its own, uh, but they're networked for a common goal through what are called emergent properties. So if you take a train and if you take uh, a track on their own, they do nothing. When you put them together, the emergent property is that you have a transport system. Now, uh, people tend to say that nature is a, a, a perfect example of a system of system. Uh, well, yes, it is to some extent, but it doesn't necessarily always work the way we want. So what I've shown here are two examples of nature not working quite brilliantly. So the tree on the left hand side uh, fell or rather was created by a seedling falling on top of that big rock. Uh, it was had a bit of soil over it. So it was quite a comfortable place for the seedling to sit. But over time, the tree grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually a storm came along and threw it over because basically it didn't sit safely enough. The tree on the right hand side, on the other hand, um, decided to grow and grow and grow out of the crack in which it had fallen. And of course, that was also not a very successful move because it basically took down the rock in which it was growing. And basically, once established, trees have no options. Of course, human beings, when we build things, we have got options and we should not just think about the moment, we should think about the long term. So as are systems of systems just 21st century creations? Because that's what we often hear. Oh, I deal with systems of systems. It's a really new thing. Well, it's not. Uh, as we've seen, uh, one of the characteristics of a system of systems is managerial, de developmental, and operational independence. So each part can grow on its own. It can be changed. Uh, in general, we have got very rapid requirements evolution. So a part of the system needs to be changed because some factor doesn't work anymore. There's very often lots of disparate stakeholders with conflicting views and conflicting needs. In many cases, they have very little incentive to work together. We see that in uh, some countries where buses and trains have got different stations and you just can't get to between them because it's not set up properly. There are no incentives for them to work together. Uh, then we've got emergence. So all these interacting and inter interlinked systems uh, produce behaviors which are not those of the individual parts. And in many cases, the system of systems is geographically dispersed and connected through a network. Now that sounds very much like uh, a railway. So this is the characteristics of the early GB railways, very similar in Ireland. You had lots and lots of different railways with separate owners and operators. The networks grew very quickly. So did the services and the number of passengers and performance of the system. Um, everybody had very different needs and aspirations. 
cities, passengers, shareholders, they all had conflicts in what they wanted. Uh, there was emergence of cross-network travel and new rules being required to manage that. And both in England and in Ireland, the system of systems spread across the whole country, uh, connected basically through the rails. And that became British Railways. And of course, in Ireland, it became uh, Irish Rail eventually, and in Northern Ireland, um, Northern Ireland Railways. So uh, I'm just going to go back into a bit of history now, because railways and systems engineering have been together for about 216, 217 years. Um, the earliest systems, which could be described as railed ways in a way, uh, were mines in mines. And this is an example from a, a German uh, silver mine. Uh, and basically you had a smooth running uh, surface with planks and you had a pin between the planks on the right hand side, which guided the vehicle. Uh, they were called hunde or dogs. Uh, and it was a very useful innovation because the tunnels could be smaller because the profile, of course, was constant, and uh, the operation was much smoother, which meant you could uh, use children or uh, not so strong people to push your mining trolleys along the track. Um, it was brought to the Lake District in Britain in about 1600, so that's the earliest time when we are aware of that. But of course, that wasn't the earliest railways. They tended to, the railways of the sort of 1700s were generally built from wood, wood uh, which is why they were called tramways or uh, railroads. And the wood uh, led to the name tram, because that's a trammel, is a piece of wood in German, which is just another indication that it was actually brought to the English speaking world by German miners. Why is it such a good system? Well, it's because largely because we transfer the load from the wheel to the ground. So uh, as we do that, there is a, a very interesting behavior. So this is a, a network rail standard in the UK. And it basically says the dynamic wheel force must not be greater than 350 kilonewtons per uh, contact point between a wheel and the rail. Now, that gives you a very interesting pressure distribution. And please note, this is logarithmic. So at the top of the rail, uh, we've got a very, very large number, 2.8 kilonewtons per square millimeter. That's equivalent to 280 bags of sugar sitting on an area which is really, very, very small. Uh, by the time we reach the rail foot, that has gone down to 35 Newton per square millimeter. So that's roughly uh, 350 grams uh, per square millimeter. At the bottom of the sleeper, it's 3.5 Newton per square millimeter. And by the time we reach the bottom of the sand blanket, we are talking about very, very little in terms of pressure on the ground, which is why railways can run quite comfortably over uh, soft ground. Uh, for example, Stevenson's railway between Liverpool and Manchester ran across the swamp. Everybody thought it was impossible, but Stevenson said, oh, it's fine. You can rail run railways even over iced over lakes, as they did in uh, Siberia before the Trans-Siberian Railway was quite finished. So the, the design of the railway, the concept is extremely powerful. Um, now, Let's go back even further. Why am I going back even further? Well, you see it in a moment. The Diolkos was built in about 600 uh, BC by the tyrant of Corinth. Uh, it was in operation for 500 years uh, and was intended to allow ships to avoid the trip around the Peloponnese. It was very primitive, but it was actually done uh, by stonemasons. And in some places they actually had to put slabs down in order to create this carriageway. About six and a half kilometers. And what is relevant for Ireland, of course, is that the track gauge was about 1600 millimeters. So the Irish are simply continuing the tradition 
of the Greeks, which I think is quite a nice little feature. Uh, by the way, it only took about three hours uh, to take a boat, uh, a trireme, for example, across the isthmus, but you needed a lot of people for that. About 150 were pulling on the ropes. Uh, and so we come to this really strange chapter about why are there so many track gauges in the world? And I've just picked out the Irish track gauge here, uh, 1600 millimeters, as it was used on the Diolkos. Uh, it was also used in Switzerland, in Baden, uh, which is a state of Germany, and of course in Ireland, in parts of Australia, and in Brazil. The situation in Switzerland was quite strange because the first railway in Switzerland was actually built by uh, people from England, uh, but they used the track gauge of the Grand Duchy of Baden, uh, which was 1600 millimeters, because even in those days they were sort of metric. Uh, but of course, both of those were converted to standard gauge or Stevenson's gauge uh, after that. Why, uh, why 600 millimeters in Ireland? Well, I think it was a compromise to some extent because the Railway Regulation Act for the whole United Kingdom mandated standard gauge for mainline railways in Great Britain and 1600 millimeters for Ireland. And there was actually come some very significant fines. This is um, for all railways under the Act, so all mainline railways in the UK. Uh, if you decided to build one which was the wrong gauge, you had to pay £10 per mile um, per day for the whole time the railway was in position. So there was a strong disincentive uh, on from being a building a railway which was not standard gauge or Irish gauge. Uh, of course, Australia uh, must have had people from uh, Ireland who built their railways because it was quite a bit after the Gauge Act. And in Brazil, it must have always be, also been the Irish who started to build railways. So I think the all costs Ireland and the world. Now, of course, once you brought BIP, track and train together, it was a bit of a daunting prospect. So Trevithick, Burton, Blenkinsop, etc., were all convinced that if you had iron or steel wheels running on steel rails, it would inevitably end up doing this. It would just spin. It wouldn't do anything. And uh, the Trevithick locomotive of 2 was very basic, but it was, uh, uh, I think it's quite a nice illustration of how a lot of work all the time. Um, but the big invention of Trevithick was not a piston and cylinder, because that had been around for a long time. But his invention was that he put steam and because he didn't believe in adhesion. And uh, that was one of the reasons why um, his steam circus in Bloomsbury, London, uh, was a bit of a disaster because the locomotive, Catch Me Who Can, uh, which was running round in circles there for a fee, uh, unfortunately broke the rails on a regular basis and Trevithick gave up in disgust. Uh, Blakinsop uh, was a bit luckier. He invented his own system of propulsion in 1811 because he also didn't believe in uh, adhesion. He decided to use a, a rack and pinion system. And uh, so uh, the running wheels were just uh, trailing. They were not actually doing anything. Uh, it was the uh, rack and pinion uh, alongside the rails and a separate piston driven uh, opinion on the locomotive, which actually did the propulsion. And that worked remarkably well. And of course, it's still a system used by uh, many mountain railways, uh, adapted by Marsh, Rickenbach, Abt, Locher, Strube, and others. So there's a lot of different systems, 
and they have been very successful on very steep hills. Uh, William Burton had a different approach. Uh, I would sort of term it a bit bizarre, but it was actually quite successful. Uh, he managed to go up hills of one in 50 and one in 36, so 3%, which is very, very challenging. Uh, and he built two locomotives, but number two blew up uh, when somebody had tied down uh, the safety valve and overfired the locomotive. So unfortunately killed quite a few spectators, but it was certainly not going to uh, be a long-term solution. Ireland had its own solution. The Darkey to Kingstown atmospheric railway, which was opened in 1844, was also built by people who didn't believe in adhesion. You had pumping stations which evacuated the pipe between the rails. Um, and I'm hoping I can show that here. Yes, the pipe between the rails. The pumping stations were at regular intervals along the track. They would ev evacuate uh, the pipe here. In the pipe, uh, there was a slot which was covered with leather. And in that slot was a paddle which was pushed along uh, by the air pressure which was behind uh, the piston. And when the seal was closed, uh, the whole system worked. Now, unlike um, later systems, this actually worked for 10 years and it was very successful. Uh, I mean, 1844, it managed to achieve 48 kilometers per hour uphill from Dunleary to Dalkey. And it had to go a bit slower downhill because braking was actually more difficult uh, than accelerating because you can't really brake against the vacuum. Mr. Brunel copied the system in 1848 for his line in Devon, uh, but he only used his for a year because the rats got at the leather. And in summer, of course, the uh, grease would dry out and in winter uh, it tended to freeze or rather water tended to freeze in the pipes. So in 1812, already William Headley had showed that adhesion actually works. Um, because the owner of Bylam Colliery was a bit fed up with all these peculiar systems and he said to William Headley, can you actually make the railway work without any of these fancy things? Because Blinkinsop had of course just demonstrated this system. And uh, Headley uh, together with Timothy Hackworth, who was a very famous locomotive builder later on, built this carriage with two people uh, on each side, uh, propelling uh, the train with just muscle power. Weights, very importantly, on the carriage, which was pro operating, and it was pulling two heavily loaded uh, coal wagons. And it demonstrated that it works. There are, of course, other people who had uh, already decided that it would work, but Headley actually make, made himself famous by doing so. And it actually works very well. So here is a 12% gradient, which is very frequently uh, exists, for example, uh, in Lisbon for the tramways uh, without any um, difficulty at all. Um, some Lisbon trams manage 13.5%, uh, but that's largely because uh, their wheelbase is relatively long compared to the track gate, to the curves, and therefore they basically jammed themselves into the rails. <clears throat> and I think the big step was when George and Robert Stevenson built uh, the rocket for the tests uh, between Liverpool and Manchester uh, at Rainhill. Their biggest point was that they had uh, built both speed and reliability into their locomotive. It achieved 48 kilometers per hour uh, several times. And on the third day, it covered uh, 112 kilometers, which was uh, running backwards and forwards, which was basically the return journey from Liverpool to Manchester, or as a Man Mancunian, I would probably say from Manchester to Liverpool. And only Rocket <coughs> was successful. <coughs> 
in the trials. Now, Ireland also had its own uh, claim to glory with the Lartigue monorail uh, between Listowel and Palibunyan. Uh, it had been invented in Algeria, tested in the Sahara. It was uh, a monorail, and it was a true monorail because there was only one rail and the wheel on top. Uh, however, of course, there were side guidance wheels on the um, little rails, which you can see down here. So a very peculiar system. People sat in a, a cab, cabin either side of the, of the track. Uh, the locomotive required two fireboxes, two, um, two boilers, two chimneys, etc., and only one driver. The driver had to work on both sides. Uh, and the, of course, the um, firemen also had to work on both sides. Um, Bridget and I went to see this uh, in Listowel two years ago. Very impressive. Uh, it's well worth a visit if you haven't been. It's a very short railway and they really make a very good show. But now I should go back to systems engineering and railways because I've talked a lot, enough about history. Um, railway systems are both complicated and complex. Uh, and so what we've got here is uh, complicating aspects. Uh, there's what I call dispersion. So we've got physical and organizational dispersion, people, assets, customers, information, all of these are distributed across the network. And that makes it much more difficult to manage than a factory or uh, a business which is located in one place. The second element, which is very difficult to manage, is the complicated nature of having so many different components. Uh, diversity is what I call it. You've got physical diversity, asset types, components, asset performance, asset lives, and you've got the organizational compli uh, complication of having uh, diverse products, uh, diverse staff skills, mixed traffic operations, uh, lots of different stakeholders with different views, different funding models, uh, different fare systems. So these are the two complicating aspects of railways. You've also got uh, complicate things which are complex because they are not predictable, they're not easily managed. And so amongst those is variability. You've got again, organizational and physical variability, uh, the uh, physical ones, earth movement, for example, ground stability, changing weather, uh, changing adhesion, uh, degradation and wear of the system, which is very difficult to predict and therefore difficult to manage. You've got staff de performance, client demands against stakeholders. You've got third party activities. Just think of level crossings. You've got the economic context, which is currently very difficult. You've got funding changes, etc. And then on the right hand side, you've got the interdependence between systems. Uh, and interdependence is made up of coupling. Uh, for example, the wheel rail interface, the interface between pantograph and overhead line, uh, switches and crossings on the physical side and organizationally on timetables, rosters, schedules. You can't run a service without a train. And if it's a train with staff, then of course you need to have the right member of staff in the right place at the right time. And that's what I call coupling. And then of course you've got the interactions You've got the forces which take place between the wheels and the rails. You've got the maintenance activities. You've got the product and process regulations, etc. There's a hell of a lot of things which are not easy to manage. Uh, but they are generally designed by people. <clears throat> and here is an example of one of these systems which um, is exhibiting many complicating features and also many complex ones. It's cross rail. It's the line across London from the east to the west or the west to the east. It has been going on for more than 20 years, a lot of stakeholders. It's a very ambitious project and uh, the system delivery has become extremely 
difficult because too many things were put into the system at the same time. So I'm just showing here uh, the railway control system, the signaling system uh, with three different types uh, between east and west and uh, the branch to Heathrow and with the branch uh, to, uh, the, to, the, to the south east. And then also, of course, the central zone, which is a metro type control system. The interfacing between those different systems is very complicated, but it's also complex because to some extent it's not predictable. Here I'm giving an example of asset management, this dispersion and diversity. It's from a very close friend in Australia. And this is just one particular uh, set of components. It's basically point machines. And what you can see here is that there are something like uh, 2,000 point machines, so a uh, large number, all distributed across the network of 29 different types. And there's just no way that you can standardize them because by the time you have finished standardizing them, you've had to introduce several new types because it takes too long and it's too expensive. And you need 29 different procedures, the 29 different sets of spares, 29 people's skills in order to manage the system. It's manageable, you can have lists, etc., but it's not easy. Uh, you can have databases and procedures. It costs money, it costs time. Variability is an interesting one. Uh, this is a picture from last year, well, between 2018 and 2020, and it shows the performance of a uh, passenger railway again in Australia. And it shows at the top the delivery, which is how many trains were actually running. And they were doing always very well on that. They had between 98 and 99%. Uh, it went up uh, in March 2020 and punctuality went up hugely in March 2020 because there are no passengers. Now, <clears throat> that's of course not something which we want but it may teach us some lessons in how we can manage the system better by actually controlling the variability rather than controlling the technology. Uh, we must start at the design of the system if we want to manage complexity successfully. Basically, complex systems don't follow predictions. They respond to events which happen in their context. Uh, they uh, have components which sense what's going on and will change their behaviors. They adapt as the environment changes. Uh, they adapt to other agents in the system, which of course is the system of systems idea. They evolve, they specialize, they generalize. So uh, this is just an example of the development of different kinds of uh, animals and plants, etc. And you just have to sort of see how many things can happen over a long period of time. It may not be the same for a railway, but it is quite significant. Now, also to do with complexity on railways is Charles Perrault's normal accident theory. Uh, he was a sociologist at Yale and Stanford, and he was inspired to come up with this theory by the Three Mile Island nuclear plant. He basically says the syst complex systems are those where the subsystems are tightly coupled. You remember I was talking about that earlier, which have got meshed interactions and therefore the, the potential for catastrophes. And he basically says that accidents are not and incidents are not avoidable in such systems, regardless of the amount of effort you make to prevent them. And of course, uh, two examples are Fukushima, uh, and uh, one I'm going to mention later on is Stonehaven. He says that technical solutions are not adequate because most incidents have organizationals, what he doesn't say, people routes. Uh, and we may have to sort of think very carefully about not using very complex technology anymore. So the Stonehaven derailment happened last summer. The investigation report or the first investigation report has just come out. Uh, and the cause of the accident was 
really to do with uh, the infrastructure which have been designed for different kinds of weather. So what happened here was we had large fields uh, with very little uh, strong vegetation and they have been draining down towards the railway for many, many years. In 2010, I think it was, the railway decided to control this better and they built a drain for and the drainage system for the field up here. And that drain was taken down the hill, uh, was taken to a pit next to the railway and then a pipe outfall into the river, which was just a little bit further along. Uh, the, it was put into a ditch and the, the ditch was, the, the pipe was covered uh, with ballast and rocks. Uh, and on the particular day, uh, there were 25 millimeters of rain in four hours. That is uh, an average, 75% uh, of an average August rainfall. Uh, what happened was that the rainfall, the pipe was insufficient to take the water down and the water basically took the covering stones and put them onto the railway. Uh, a train uh, had come past this site uh, and was then going back because there was a, an, a, another blockage along the line and as it hit the ballast, the train was derailed. Uh, so it's not necessarily possible to prevent things like that because actually people had made a lot of effort to prevent problems of this nature. And why is it not easy? Well, it's about three things. It's about comprehensions because we can't fully comprehend what incidents might happen. Incidents are generally fraught with uncertainty, but we could never expect to have that rainfall in four hours. And sometimes the remediation items will actually contribute to further incidents, which is what happened at Stonehaven. So it was a catastrophic in, uh, accident. Uh, we have to say that luckily it happened during the pandemic because there were very few people on the train, but, and the train in general behaved uh, very well. well. Uh, it's about understandability, because if we manage the small stuff, that does not necessarily pre prevent big incidents. Uh, there are not causes which we can find quickly. We tend to construct those four causes after the event. Uh, this is an accident which happened at Klangenig in South Wales, where a freight train uh, had uh, been had, had wheels which have been sliding, wheel flats, the wheel flats uh, damaged the track, but more importantly, uh, they, damaged, they damaged the track so much that several vehicles of uh, a fuel train derailed were set on fire. Uh, once we found out afterwards, that was fine, but we couldn't actually expect to understand that beforehand. And then predicting things from the last incidents will not allow us to predict the next incidents because complex systems are basically not deterministic. We can't precisely or repeatedly foretell what's going to happen. So this is a, an, an example of flooding uh, in the southwest of England. Uh, it happens every year probably, but not always in the same place. And basically these things uh, are uh, based on the concept by Ryan Kitchens, who is a software engineer. Because what he says, success and failure have the same genesis. So what we've got here is normal work, normal duties, and we get performance variability. Now, performance variability uh, is dealt with very often by workarounds because the standard rule doesn't work, or uh, it's, it's dealt with by non-compliance with the rules. And very often that actually is successful. It's not the best situation, of course, because we can't predict exactly that it is going to be successful. On the other hand, the same performance variability, and the same types of workaround, the same non-compliance non can uh, lead to failure. 
And what basically this says is, if we try to prevent the things on the right hand side, we may actually prevent uh, workarounds and non-compliance, which are successful and which allow us to do things even with performance variability. So what uh, Kitchen says is, don't try to constrain performance variability in order to remove human failures because it will affect your everyday work as well. You have to have a careful balance. Um, he suggests some other approaches uh, because, for example, the Toyota's five whys approach is limiting. The so Toyota approach is basically, uh, why did the train derail? Then you look uh, three or four whys and then another level of whys. But at each level, you actually exclude some potentially useful information. To learn more from incidents, Kitchen suggests that you ask how, not why. Because this results in stories, not guesswork. Because there are really very little, rarely root causes which you can simply identify, particularly not in advance. How allows the person to tell you what they thought and what was the context when an incident occurred? You can make sure that things go right rather than preventing them from going wrong. You, you relabel incidents into surprises. You learn from success. So that's his view. And he gives a very nice example. Um, there was an accident in France where some skiers uh, were covered in an avalanche. Uh, they could retrieve themselves, but they're injured. So a helicopter had to land and take them off. Uh, the helicopter pilot was touching uh, the ground. He couldn't land because of the surface. Uh, the propeller blew up snow. Uh, he was acting way out of the normal parameters and what he was supposed to do. Everybody got on and the pilot was a hero. Now, exactly the same circumstances, uh, if there had been a rock in that snow uh, or a, a big block of ice, the helicopter blades would have broken and it would have been a disaster with five or six deaths. The pilot would have been a criminal. So that's how easy it is actually to go wrong when you try to limit what is happening. Uh, so uh, my friend, um, Alex McGrath in Australia uh, is illustrating this to some extent with the system lifecycle model. And we'll have a quick look at that now because it's a standard approach for systems engineering. So you start on the left-hand side with the concept, what you would like to do. You make some definitions, you find the requirements, you apportion uh, the system requirements to the different parts of the system. You design things, you make them, uh, and you put them together, you install them, you system validate, you commission the system, you accept it into service, you operate it, maintain it, and you then decommission and dispose of it. On the left hand side, we need verification after every step and the same on the right hand side. Now, this is the understanding the problem part. You've then got uh, the implementing part. And finally, we have got the maintaining of the operation over time. And all of these require different skills. Uh, some of these things are complex. Some of these are complicated. We try to make them complicated, simple, but uh, particularly the operation over time tends to be uh, a complex procedure because you're now under the influence of your environment. So addressing complication here, uh, addressing complexity in the design, uh, and addressing complica uh, complexity in uh, running the system. I think I said that quite early on that you have to address complexity during uh, the earliest phases of the system design. And what Alex, uh, has come up with and is very strongly advocating is what she calls the complex systems adaptive cycle. 
Uh, it's from a concept called resilience thinking by Walker and Salt. And so basically we start um, with rapid growth. So the time when the railways were first invented, uh, they grew very, very quickly. Lots of investment was happening. Um, but that could only happen after you had conceived the system. Right at the beginning, as we have seen, there was lots of experimentation. But then people thought, this is works. This is worth investing in. So they spent lots of money. Uh, then, of course, as you did that, there has a lot of complicated problem solving as you learn new lessons, uh, as you uh, cover new ground, higher bridges, longer tunnels, etc. Then it comes to con con conservation. So you keep things about the same. Uh, and uh, that means standardization. You have a focus on process and procedures. You consolidate control and everything sort of runs smoothly. But then uh, there's a shock. I mean, we have a shock at the moment of the pandemic, of course. Uh, and that shock means that you have to start doing things differently. It triggers fundamental change. And you have to go back to reorganization. You have to go back to experimentation. And if you don't do it fast enough, uh, then you will end up with a catastrophe. And that's, of course, not desirable at all. So uh, again, innovation, lots of changes, and hopefully resolving the solution. And uh, where does this all lead? Well, we need a lot of resilience. When we have got the standardized system, we need to be aware of the fact that it needs to move at some point and that we need to be able to uh, make new progress, uh, change the system, which is what I said at the beginning, change is so important. And that stress or crisis then uh, allows us to come out of it, hopefully with a better system. Of course, as I said, uh, if we don't set up resilience right at the beginning, then the system will not work well. Uh, so uh, here is an example of a slow moving system wide stress track condition. It's an example from uh, New Zealand from last sem summer when Kiwi Rail had to impose a speed restriction of 40 kilometers per hour across the entire network for six months because they had found that track wear was more widespread and worse than had previously been understood. Um, so they had to replace a lot of track. They had to run fewer trains for a while. And it was a success because people had actually monitored the system. They had not just relied on the system working well, uh, they had continuously monitored and taken the right action at the right time. Okay, so that was a sort of very fast cruise through some systems thinking and systems engineering. And I'm not going to talk a little bit about uh, the affinity, affinity of myself and also my younger brother, Thomas, with railways. Uh, our parents were very keen for us to be independent. And so we were quite often allowed to travel on trains by ourselves. And this is such an excursion near uh, Zurich, where we grew up. Uh, Thomas uh, was very impressed by this. And as you can see, he turned it into art uh, by painting uh, ceramics uh, with trains. And as you can also see, he was actually quite advanced already. So steam locomotive, of course, needs steam and smoke. Uh, freight cars are essential. Uh, and in Switzerland, you will mostly see electric trains. I think he would not have had the same experience in Ireland. He would have had to go to Dublin for that. So, uh, and of course, we had to have a model railway. So we were very early on influenced by our parents to be interested in railways. Uh, I did my uh, education in Switzerland. I did uh, baccalaureate in classics. Then I studied uh, electrical and electronic engineering because I was interested in mathematics, but in applied maths. Uh, I then became uh, a software engineer in Switzerland, but that was really, really very, very 
um, how should I call it, addictive. And after two years, I decided to move to England and I became a control engineer with GEC Traction, working with practical electricity and actually learning to understand what electricity is. I did that for three and a half years. Then I moved to UMIST as a research assistant in very low current electronics. Then I became a research associate in mechanical engineering at the University of Salford. Uh, they became a lecturer in computer integrated manufacturing at Brunel near London, and then did my PhD at Brunel University as well. Now, these are just some little snippets of uh, my professional experience. Here, the Vulcan foundry in Newton Le Willows between 1832 and 2002, uh, and I was there around 1980, 1981. Uh, it was originally built to construct bridges for the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, but they then were built locomotives all over the place. Diesels, electrics, uh, it was bought by English Electric, uh, then GEC, and then Alstom, who shut the site and turned it into a housing estate. And um, of course, I had to learn quite a lot because I had never worked in a manufacturing environment. And I learned a hell of a lot from Paddy, who is shown here next to an Easington Colliery man rider locomotive. Um, Paddy was feared in the company because any manager who came into uh, the factory, uh, and it didn't really matter what the manager was, would be um, sort of described in un um, impolite terms, I think. The four letter word happened all the time uh, and probably every second word. So I went into this factory as a young engineer of 29 and I found it very disconcerting that a, a older person would treat me like that. I did discover why he had lost a leg in the service of the company and had not really been treated very well. Uh, so I just listened and went home and then I practiced at home. The next day I came in and uh, Paddy started his usual uh, com com conversational style and I basically let off a stream of filth which didn't repeat itself and Paddy was just shaken. He said, why are you talking to me like that? And I said, well, because you are talking to me in a way which I find unacceptable. Can't we be friends? And Paddy said, that's quite a good idea. Let's be friends. And so for the next year, I was working with Paddy and it was a fantastic working relationship. I think it will probably be impossible to do that today, but it was a good lesson in management, which I still remember fondly, as you can tell. Uh, we built the Amax locomotive, uh, which here is awaiting shipment. Uh, and this is me. And you can tell everybody else is rather a lot older than me, but very experienced engineers, uh, managers, quality people, uh, fitters. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with them. Uh, we were building uh, what was at the time the most advanced uh, traction system on the right hand side. Here are parts of our CEPEX chopper, separately excited DC machine chopper. And um, that was a fantastic experience for me. Now, uh, it was interesting because that um, chopper was part of an evolution uh, which took 40 years. Uh, in the 1970s, we were still building trains with resistance controls. Then came series choppers, etc., etc inverters with GTOs, inverters with IGBTs, etc. What next? And every single was a big change. Every single step required a lot of research, uh, a lot of development, a lot of experimentation, and therefore also a lot of cost and delay. If you compare that with the Rolls-Royce French engine, uh, which has 50, had 50 years of evolution, there was no revolutionary step involved in there. And so therefore, every single innovation actually worked very, very quickly, rather than the railway where we had to change things wholesale. This was my last GEC traction project, and I thought I should talk about it 
because uh, I'm in, in Ireland. Uh, I was involved in, towards the end of my time at GEC, actually, my last three weeks, in assessing whether these trains needed what's called high-speed circuit breakers. High-speed circuit breakers are extremely expensive and they had not been budgeted. They had budgeted something much cheaper. So I was asked to calculate uh, whether the uh, original equipment was going to work. Uh, and I spent three weeks doing maths and physics. And at the end of it, I said, yes, it should work. You can use the cheaper kit. Everybody said, phew, and I had some sleepless nights because I was always waiting for one of these trains to go up in flames. Uh, well, it didn't. The two which had to be scrapped after a fire at Fairview Depot actually burned because the depot was on fire, not because the train was on fire. But it just shows sort of that I was very interested in what I was doing. And of course, the picture above also contains a level crossing and signals, and they became important later in my life. Now, why did I end up in education? Of course, as Larkin says, it was the parents' fault. <clears throat> this is um, my our dad. Uh, he was teaching me metalwork to girls. Now, that was completely unheard of in uh, the late 1950s. Uh, but you can see they were very enthusiastic and keen. 14-year-olds uh, who had never done anything with their hands apart from knitting and sewing. And he introduced that and it was a big success. <clears throat> now, uh, all the same, I knew that I would never be a teacher. I was absolutely sure of that because why would I be? Dad was a teacher, so I wouldn't want to be one. Mum was very bright and competent and she got Thomas and me involved in teaching maths for struggling kids. Because we were a bit short of money, that was very good because it was well paid. Uh, when I got to GEC, I thought, oh, well, I should do something for society. So I taught literacy, literacy and arithmetics with NACRO, uh, the association which looked after um, people who had been um, in, um, in prison, etc. I learned classroom control uh, uh, when I was a research assistant, and so I really ended up in teaching. Here was teaching um, computer integrated manufacturing. And here we've got a very large group of my students who uh, also did leadership training without noticing it while they were learning about manufacturing. I then had a year in Switzerland uh, where I was uh, a railway inspector. Uh, my brother got me this job. And as a result, I then became a lecturer at the University of Sheffield uh, because I just slithered into it. It's called seri, serendipity. And one of the things I did while I was working for the Swiss government was to uh, uh, test level crossings. And this level crossing was near the Mortarach Glacier, uh, an absolutely amazing environment to do a job like that. A very steep railway. And I also came across uh, uh, an example of very poor systems engineering. It's what's called the tail of the violet signal aspect. Uh, a mainland railway in Switzerland, which was running through the Alps, and you can see it's a very difficult terrain, uh, had been committed uh, to uh, enhance their infrastructure so that they could carry high containers. So that involved uh, high and wide containers. So that involved uh, going through tunnels, which were not quite up to the job, uh, and along uh, ledges which were also problematic uh, and they also had to of course accommodate standard trains uh, and the worst thing about it was that it was not a long-term problem because they were building a base space tunnel at the same time so uh, they decided to use a separate signal aspects uh, and i'm not going to talk in great detail about this because the slide will tell us more so what they decided to do was to create a track which was uh, uh, suitable for these large trains and keep the other track uh, to for standard size trains. And where there was uh, this restricted space, 
it, there was only one track which was capable of the large trains, otherwise both. So they then used the train describer to tell the train driver whether they could enter a particular section. And I'll show that as a, uh, an example in a second here. Their idea was that they had the two channel safety principle. Uh, the driver uh, was the one channel and the route setting system and the interlocking was the other channel. Uh, and this is a common approach uh, in conventional uh, railway safety systems. For example, the Irish system, the UK system, the old UK system, the German system, where the driver is one channel and the train stop system is the second channel. But in order for this to work, the two channels have to be completely independent and both have to be in highly reliable. Now, what I discovered that uh, the railway had made as a mistake in Switzerland was that they uh, had a situation where the driver was taught to see and do the wrong thing because the automatic routing system was actually very, very reliable. And I calculated that you would make a mistake once about every 15 years per driver. So very, very rarely. So a driver would 99.99% uh, of the time uh, see a situation which was uh, absolutely perfect. And then one time they wouldn't. And I'll explain that uh, why. So uh, the driver had to actually go past a signal which forbid entry into a section which uh, was not suitable for the large train. So if you are driving a train which was out of gauge, uh, then you had to uh, follow your normal signals, of course. And if you came across a violet signal, which was late, it said, you can't go into this section. Fine. That seems quite a reasonable proposition. Now, as I said, the route setting system was extremely reliable. So this would happen very, very rarely, as I said, maybe once, once in 15 years. Now, the same driver would be driving passenger trains and conventional freight trains. And they were, of course, allowed uh, past violet signals. So uh, I calculated that a train driver who did that for a day would actually see a hell of a lot of these violet signals, which they had to ignore when they were driving a conventional train. And so this was a typical situation. Uh, the dotted line are the lines which are not allowed for the big tri trains. The solid lines are the ones which are. And so there were lots and lots of signals. And I've highlighted the ones which had interdiction, interdiction signals. So a train which was, for example, traveling on this track, Swiss trains travel properly on the left, would see an interdiction signal here, would have to go past it, would have to see an interdiction signal here, would go on, and everything was fine. Uh, a train driver which came from here uh, would see uh, an interdiction signal here, would have to go past it, another uh, interdiction signal here, uh, would then uh, go into a section where both tracks were allowed. So a lot of variability and basically you were training the drivers without them noticing it to make mistakes. So this is what you can see. I did calculate uh, a, a driver on a conventional train will pass such a signal 17 times in a three hour period and then maybe sit on a locomotive which was hauling a out of gauge train. So not a good idea. Here is an example of the situation, because although I forbid uh, that this should happen, there was an appeal and after I had left, it was actually permitted. It's luckily now only used very, very infrequently, but it's still a problem. So I went back to being an academic after a year with, in Switzerland, and I, I got the job at the University of Sheffield, uh, setting up an MSc program in railway systems engineering. And I had lots of help from Bill Steinmetz, Colin Goodman, Robin Hirsch, Roger Goodall and Rod Smith. And that program is now at the University of Birmingham. Now, 
Uh, as part of that, of course, we did some experiments because it's a new course. And uh, we came up with porridge as a form educa of educational enhancement because we had 13 Turkish students one year and we thought this is a risk because there are too many people from the same background and uh, there are uh, too many novices to railways. So we created a weekend where we went working with them on a railway and Bridget and I had to cook breakfast, Bridget being my wife. And it was a very successful event. As you can see, everybody's happy, even though they have to work hard. Um, uh, we showed the people how to do things and they learned very quickly. So this is a student who had never been told in the obvious reasons. It's, it's very hard work, but being on site and lifting rails as a group really teaches you to, re to rely on each other, but also to contribute to the job. Uh, we also experiment with other things. Uh, we had, uh, we started to have study tours. Here is a study tour to the south of France. Uh, on the left hand side, one of my colleagues, Charles Watson, on the right hand side, my brother Thomas as a mature railway person uh, who was working in software by that stage. We've, we've done about 30 tours and we've seen lots and lots of things. We also set up a big program in Singapore because uh, Singapore Metro discovered that their new Metro was now 30 years old and their young engineers were retiring. This picture also shows some of my colleagues from the University of Birmingham. We've been doing this, it's a success but wasn't it hard work going out to Singapore and teaching for seven days continuously? The IMAC asked me to set up study tours for uh, engineers. Uh, these are three examples, uh, a visit to uh, Eastern Germany, uh, a visit to Austria on a different study tour, and of course, lots and lots of photographs uh, of Felix taking pictures or uh, looking like a loading gauge check on that very narrow platform. Thomas and I are still interested in railways. And as you can see, this looks a bit like a train. Well, yes, it definitely is an electric train uh, being baked as a Swiss delicacy. Thank you very much to all my photographers and many other people uh, who have contributed to the development of the MSC and who have contributed pictures to this show. But the people are most important are Sharon Berry, Holly Foss, Francesca, Joy, Deborah, um, and Brian Redfern, who have been very, very supportive uh, for very, very long periods. Of course, as a retired person, I can look back fondly. Um, I'm finishing off with something sad. The railway to Aquil Island and its sad last train, as part of our cycling around the uh, Irish uh, uh, island, uh, we also came to Aquil Island, uh, where the railway opened in order to carry 32 bodies uh, from Westport uh, to Aquil Island, and uh, it closed with the last train carrying. Uh, the 10 victims of the Kirkintilloch disaster in the same direction. Two very dreadful stories, uh, but it's, it's a very, very, uh, I would say it's an Irish history because it was predicted that the railway would open uh, by carrying death, dead people and it would close with the sad same. So uh, a strange story. Uh, thank you for listening to me and are there any questions, suggestions, etc.? Uh, one thing which we saw on our journey was the uh, famous West Clare Railway. If you have a chance, go and visit it and bring back a better photograph of the steam locomotive for me. This in the middle is the managing director and what I learned from him is that every profitable business 
needs a loss making business because otherwise the tax man will get too much of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Schmidt. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, we do have uh, I'm some too questions. Long. I'm sorry it's too long. No, you're fine, you're fine. We've got a few questions there. Um, I'm just going to uh, bring up the first question. Um, is from William Maloney, uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing William's question. Um, what is your view on the following different funding models? from an economic, project management, engineering, and operational perspective. The first funding model William references is one where significant amounts of money are spent upgrading multiple subsystems at the same time. But the second funding model that William proposes is smaller investments made at more frequent intervals and subsystems are upgraded sequentially. Well, I, I shall not use a railway example for that. I shall use a hotel example. Um, hotels in Britain uh, are built as five-star hotels, then over the years, with use, they slowly become four-star, three-star, two-star, and then somebody invests after 20 years, 20 million pounds, and it becomes a five-star hotel again, and then the same cycle starts. Is that a good idea? Well, how much can you charge for a two-star hotel per room, per night? a lot less than for a five-star one. Uh, Swiss and German hotels in general will um, re refettle a room or two rooms or three rooms every year. So the hotel stays a five-star hotel, or if you had built it as a four-star hotel, it stays a four-star hotel. To my mind, that's a better way of approaching. The problem is uh, if every year when you invest some more money, you use some different and new technology, which is what happened in Australia with the point systems. So it's not an ideal solution unless it's properly managed. But if you have a long-term plan, then continuous investment is much more effective also because you maintain a supplier base who can do the job. Thanks very much, that's a great answer. Um... We have another question now from Courtney Murphy. Um, have you any comments or observations on the construction of the Dublin to Kingston railway in 1833 to 1834, which was completed in 18 months? Uh, so the question is probably not about that railway, but about why it takes so long to build railways now, is probably the, the reason why the question was asked. Yeah, um, read the lines, yeah. Uh, it's. We, can, we have still got places where you can build railways very quickly. Now, I call tramways also railways. And if you look at France, uh, they will build a tramway in a couple of years with fairly small disruption because they do it all the time. They know how to do it. They've got good contractors and they've got good processes. In, uh, I think, Britain and Ireland, we have got a problem of too many stakeholders who all want their say. And that is the delaying factor. It's not the technology. It's not the way in which people do things. Uh, if you look at the construction of HS2, uh, which is taking a hell of a long time, uh, the reason is the obstacles which have to be overcome before you can actually put the shovel in the ground. And the expectation that you have everything absolutely planned uh, correctly before you do things. And that just takes a long time and it's not efficient. However, uh, you still need to be sure that you're actually doing the right thing. And uh, when the French build a high-speed railway, they know what they want to do. They have done it before and they use similar process processes. They don't use a new process every time. And again, that gives you speed. Thank you. Um, very, very specific question uh, from John Coffey. Um, he has a personal interest in rail track welding. Um, and what experience or information do you have on this? Uh, well, I think the first thing is, if you can 
uh, use long welded rails which are done in a factory uh, where they are electrically uh, welded, uh, uh, butt welded, you get a very much better result than if you do it on site. So use uh, continuously welded rails as much as possible. Um, on site, uh, there are several technologies. Um, the earliest technology, of course, is uh, the fire and uh, almost explosive type of welding, um, where you, you have magnesium and fili uh, iron filings, uh, which then flow into the gap as a, as a as liquid steel. Uh, if you do it very well, it produces a good result, but it's very difficult to guarantee that. Uh, so if you can do um, flash pad welding uh, on site with modern kit, that produces a better result, but it's not that easy. And it's not easy if you just have to do one or two wells. It's really, it needs, needs a significant amount of work. Uh, there, are, there is a new process developed for network rail, but unfortunately I can't remember the name, but it's, it's, it's an electric welding process which works on the basis of a, a relatively slow current. So it's less of a, of, of a problem uh, than flashpot welding where you really need very, very high currents. Both flashpot welding and this new process produce extremely good um, joints because they use the material of the rails rather than an, another material like gluing it together almost. Uh, thank you. Again, fantastic answer there. Um, I have worked for an network rail myself and worked with the track engineers in South London and would have seen a lot of the, the tech, the, the methodology described there in action. Um, we've had a question um, regarding education. From an educational perspective, this question came from Neil Carnegie, um, who also passes on his compliments for an excellent presentation. From an educational perspective, how do you think that Ireland and UK compare with Switzerland in terms of providing high quality mechanical engineers? Um, the, I think the, the, there's, a, there's a significant difference between, and I would say, I would include Germany and Switzerland, Austria, having similar education systems. Um, the mechanical engineers are probably do it, are more mathematically biased, uh, more uh, mathematically biased than uh, an engineer who studied in the UK. To some extent, that's because uh, you learn the mathematics you need for, math for engineering at university. You don't need it at learning at school. When you do a maths A level, you basically have done the first year of a German or Swiss engineering degree. Uh, and you have learned it in a school way. Whereas in Switzerland, we were taught mathematics at university in a university way, tied into our uh, elect uh, engineering education. I mean, I did electrical engineering, but we had a lot of mechanics and it was very much mathematically biased uh, and the application came later. Whereas I think in uh, Ireland and the UK, it's much more uh, practical early on and more, um, how should I put it, more rule-based rather than science-based. But uh, the original way in which we taught engineers in uh, Britain and Ireland was on the job and they learned on the job. And with night school, they actually then added the theory to it and we had fantastic engineers out of that. Uh, I think what we have lost is the practicals. We, we are teaching rules, but we don't teach the practice anymore. There's a follow-up question here, actually, which is very, very relevant. It's from somebody called Asha Doris. Um, it's a, this, Asha is a, an apprentice fitter, but is also studying a mechanical engineering degree at the same time. And, has noticed that you reference involving engineers on the floor in order to get better experience with the aspects of the railway down to students. 
Is this a model that you advocate? Um, well, I, uh, I've been involved for the last two years with uh, degree apprentices who are people who are working in the industry um, and who are doing a, a degree, a higher degree part time. Uh, I've, when I was at Brunel University, I was teaching sandwich students. So uh, they were not making sandwiches. They were six months at university. Then they went six months into industry, six months back at university. Uh, and this was three times. So they have four university periods and three industry periods. And I can tell you after the first year, first six months in industry, I was no longer teaching children. I was teaching adults who knew what they wanted to do, who knew what they wanted to achieve and who understood why it was important. And uh, the people who I'm teaching now, the, the higher degree apprentices, they know why they are there. They ask questions and uh, they give answers. And when you teach 80 people on Zoom, it's amazing how many uh, answers are actually having, happening in the chat while you're teaching. Because some people know the stuff, others don't. And that's a constant exchange. There must be, in, in a normal lecture, there must be 40 or 50 messages, which are all work-related. Uh, and that's because these people actually do the job and they do the learning. Very good. Um, we're, we've come to, um, and Asha, thanks you for your answer, as does Neil Carnegie. Um, just a couple of final things there just before I wrap up. I think that's all the questions. We might have time for one more, but just a couple of other comments that were made in the Q&A section. The first was a point of clarification from, I'm assuming, a railway colleague called Aaron McGoldrick. Crossrail has ETCs on the west, not just the Heathrow branch. Uh, well, that is correct, but only as far as the Heathrow branch starts. So it's, it's from, uh, from Westbourne Park, essentially, uh, to Heathrow. Uh, and the trains which run on the Great Western uh, Railway don't use ETCS on that stretch. It's only the, uh, the Heathrow, the, the, the crossrail trains which uh, form the Heathrow Connect service and the Heathrow Express tra trains as well. So uh, correction accepted and corrected. Thank you. And uh, just a final comment here from uh, an attendee, Richard Morgan. Richard used to work for GEC Traction on the Dart Traction equipment, which has which was advanced for its time. The fleet was refurbished and new traction equipment was installed from Siemens with the HSCB. Uh, well, the, the original equipment with uh, DC um, DC motors uh, and fairly robust choppers um, could survive a slightly longer problem than more modern, uh, more accurate, accurately rated devices. And the cost of HSCBs has come down. Uh, the cost of what was called line breakers, um, where you needed three line breakers in series, uh, has actually gone up. So I think uh, it, financially, it now doesn't make a difference. At the time when I was involved, it would have led to a loss of a million pounds rather than a profit on the contract of about 500,000. 500,000 pounds was a, worth a lot more than now. Yeah, yeah. Barely get your house now in some parts of Ireland. Indeed, yes. Okay, well, that said, they're all the questions, observations and that have come back from our attendees. So thanks very much, everybody, for your questions. We do appreciate them. Um, and we're coming up to eight o'clock now. So I think we'll take the opportunity to wrap up this evening. Um, I'd like to thank Professor Schmidt for his presentation this evening. Um, I found it fascinating, really, really enjoyable, and especially enjoyed the, the photographs from uh, your cycling holidays around Ireland and uh, the railway infrastructure you saw, especially the one in Ackle, which I've never seen myself. Um, so thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Professor Schmidt. Um, and I know you're coming to the end of your term as the chair of the railway division. Um, what are your plans or do you have further plans um, for, the rail for your career in railways after this? 
Um, well, I'm I'm doing uh, a, 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 some consultancy, uh, and at the moment I'm uh, helping a company with um, uh, fast charging batteries, because I, uh, personally I think battery um, operation on relatively short branch lines uh, with charging on the main line or charging rapidly charging at a terminus is actually probably quite a good technology because you're not turning electricity into something else and then something else again. Very good. Uh, and again, just some final thanks again from some other attendees. Uh, Michael Grace passes on his compliments and uh, Habib Yusuf also does as well. So thank you for those comments. Um, so just to wrap up this evening, um, as an alternative to electric, electric motive, we have a hydrogen uh, as a fuel source uh, presentation next Tuesday. Um, there's, a, there's a trial of hydrogen buses here in Dublin and uh, Dr. James Carton of Dublin City University will be presenting both on the technology, but also hopefully some insights as well on the local initiatives here in Dublin. So all attendees are very welcome to attend that.